Hello, I'm continuing with my book, Father of Faith, in the Footsteps of Abraham. And we're up to step two, times of testing. No pain, no gain. If it's worth having, it's worth fighting for. Genesis 12 verse 10 says this, And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. The first test Abram had to face was famine. There is nothing so severe as hunger. Food is a basic need, for without food we will inevitably die, as life cannot be sustained without it. This famine was not a mistake, it was God's doing. Creation will always carry on doing what God ordered it to do, for God set times and seasons in motion. He is the master of the wealth of the weather and earthly cycles. Psalm 119, verse 19, 1991. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. You have established the earth and it abides. They continue this day according to thine ordinances, for all are thy servants. God knows how to direct our paths. And in this instance, he used an act of nature to force Abram to uproot and take his whole entourage with him in search of the food that would keep them alive. It took a near-death experience to make Abram move because the faith that God's initial words had built up in his heart was so strong. God also used this method of famine to force Joseph's brothers to come to him in Egypt. They had no other choice but to go where the food was and God had ensured that Egypt, the world, would have all the food they needed to survive through the famine. Abram had to learn many lessons about faith. One of them was that it was impossible to inherit what God had promised immediately. The very word inherit means that you have to wait for something or someone to pass on before you can obtain it. Situations have to dramatically change. And in my experience, I've noticed that God has to make the person first before he will alter any of the situations. My husband and I have been redirected many times by God allowing adverse circumstances in our lives. Indeed, Morris would not be a preacher now if God hadn't allowed the thieves into our home to steal all our musical equipment 20 years ago. He would never have taught in house groups for three years at a time if God hadn't allowed our five-birth touring caravan to be stolen out of our back garden 17 years ago. We would have carried on touring in UK for weeks at a time, locked into our little time warp. God spoke to us beforehand about giving up what he eventually took. But we listened and were influenced by natural reasoning, such as if you don't use the talent God gave you, you lose it. And God would never tell you to do a thing like that. The problem with humanity is that we get locked into a way of thinking and don't take easily to change. So unwittingly, we force God to resort to drastic measures in order to steer us. Genesis 12, verse 11 to 13. It came to pass when Abram had come near to enter Egypt, he said unto Sarai his wife, Behold now, I know that you're a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians see you that they shall say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save you alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. From the very moment Abram left his father's house, he knew that his marriage would be a problem. He had been blessed with a very beautiful wife, who was still stunning, even though she was probably nearly 70 years old, at the time this event took place. Indeed, it was when Abram realised what the implications of having a gorgeous wife could mean, it could cost him his very life, that he made a plan to avert trouble. He was living in a godless world, where men were living by their consciences. There was no law saying, thou shalt not commit adultery. It was up to every man how he should behave. And there were some very selfish, covetous men out there whose consciences were hardened and unconcerned for the feelings of others. Genesis 20, 
verse 12 to 13. She is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house, I said unto her, This is thy kindness, which you shall show me. Every place where we come, say of me, he is my brother. There was no lie in the story they both hatched up together. It was completely true. Neither were Abram nor Sarah reprimanded for allowing others to believe that this was their relationship. I find that people are very judgmental and won't allow compassion to be a part of their appraisals of the way others act. This was something Jesus criticised the Pharisees for, forgetting the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy and faith. God allowed them to pursue this course because Abram had to experience everything God experiences and losing his wife was one of those experiences. Abram was a prophet and the love he had for his wife must have been something very close to the love God had for Israel. Genesis 12, 14 to 16. And it came to pass that when Abram was coming to Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. The princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And he entreated Abram well for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen and asses, men servant and maid servants, and she asses and camels. Just think of it. The most powerful man on earth, the Pharaoh, king of Egypt, wanted the woman he thought to be Abram's sister, which in actual fact meant that Abram would become a brother-in-law to Pharaoh. He would have been well looked after, being in the family, for Pharaoh had already paid him handsomely, and I'm sure he would have continued to do so while ever Sarah kept him sweet. This was a test to see whether Abram was covetous or not. Jesus said, you can't serve God and mammon, meaning God and riches. So God had to see what was in Abram's heart. He needed to know why Abram was following him. Was it for love of God or the benefits he was being promised? Which God did Abram really want to serve? Jehovah or wealth? I don't for one moment think that Abram was at this point yet of really loving God with all his heart. He was just starting out on this walk of faith and getting to know him. But I do think Abram knew this relationship was blossoming and beginning to get more and more personal. Although Abram was a rich man already, he didn't want another woman, even though the one he had was barren. If it was a wife he wanted for physical satisfaction, he could take his pick from either his own clan or from Egypt. He was rich and free to have as many wives as he chose to have. Whatever the Pharaoh was tempting him with, this very passage of scripture proves to me that Sarai meant everything to Abram. I think any other husband would have been sorely tempted with this situation, but the love he had for Sarai far outweighed any love he had for riches. He would much rather have her than all the wealth of Egypt. He must have really loved her with a very strong passion. How else could he have prophesied the feelings of God? This theme of love and romance seems to flow throughout the whole Bible. I'm constantly enthralled by passages talking of the love of God for Israel, the love of Christ for his church, the love of a husband for his wife, the way of a man with the maid. It thrills me to know that God upholds the idea of men passionately loving and cherishing their wives, even to the point where they will give their lives to protect them. If, as Jesus said, love fulfills the law, then how important is love for the fulfillment of God's plans and purposes? Love is spiritual, whether it's between a man and woman or a man and God. And this is the essential ingredient that God is looking for. The child who was going to ultimately be given as a fulfilment of promise had to be a loved child, not a child of mere duty or destiny. Abram had never faced this situation of losing Sarai before, so he had no idea of how it would affect him. He must have been beside himself, 
thinking that his wife was in the arms of another man. Yes, Abram was a blessed man in many ways, but the fact that he had a beautiful wife could almost seem like a curse, for there was always someone who wanted to steal her, and that was why they made the brother-sister arrangement between themselves. She was indeed a wonderful prize, a glorious, flattering boost to his ego. Just to gaze on her must have brought him immense pleasure and gratification. But her beauty was a fearful and constant threat to his personal welfare. I always dreaded the idea of being married to a really handsome guy. It's hard enough trying to live a clean, pure life in this polluted world without having to worry about all the sex mad, liberated and conscious free females out there who would be flinging themselves at him. I could never live as I do now, supporting my husband to go out preaching every night. It would drive me crazy with jealousy in case he had a roving eye or was enticed. The world Abram was living in back then was probably no different to how it is now. Perhaps it was even worse. Everyone did what they thought was right in their own eyes. There were no restrictions other than the laws and customs that certain civilizations enforced. God knew what he was leading Abram into. He allowed this trial because both Abram and Sarai were being trained for a higher objective. Each test would be a stepping stone towards the goal God had in mind for them. Sarai was not exempt from God's scrutiny and his spotlight was searching her innermost desires too. This was a test for her and we must remember she had just been forced to flee from a fierce famine. She was every inch a woman, and a very beautiful woman at that. So she must have been well aware of the effect she had on men. Now she found she was attracting this mighty, powerful, influential, charismatic man, the ruler of the whole magnificent empire of Egypt, who wanted to lavish gifts and attention on her. It was very likely that he had other wives and she would have to share his affection. But it's possible that this may not have posed any problem for her. I know many women who can live without a man, as they put it. They're very happy to look after the house and children so long as they're provided for, have a wifely status, but are not necessarily required to be subjected much to the marriage bed. If this had been her persuasion, it could well have suited her lifestyle very nicely. What an intoxicating experience for any woman to have to face. The Pharaoh had already paid her brother handsomely for the privilege of taking her to himself, so what worldly thing could he possibly withhold from her? Nothing. She could have whatever she wanted. She didn't need to wander the desert any longer. She could live in a king's palace wear the finest of clothes, bathe in rare spices and perfumes, eat exotic delicacies, sleep on fine beds, be waited on hand and foot. All this for the rest of her life. All she needed to do was submit to what was being offered now, and she had her future made. Neither did she need to worry about Abram, for the Pharaoh had not only financially blessed him, but had given succor to all her people who were even now being fed from the fat of the land. What a temptation! What woman could resist? I'm sure that if Sarai had secretly desired what was being offered to her, then the Lord would have allowed her to have her heart's desire. You must remember that this trial was of the Lord because he was sifting them. He's not interested in what we profess. He's interested in what's in the depths of our hearts. And he has to dangle the carrots before our eyes in order to see how we react. Temptations are a vital part of our walk with God, for they reveal to him and to us what we truly want and have placed our faith in. So why did she resist? The Bible tells us some wonderful things about this woman. Although she had been married for many years, she was still deeply in love with her beloved husband and wasn't on the lookout for anyone else, which was another reason for her saying she was his sister. She was chaste and could, and could be trusted completely. 
She had such a tremendous respect and admiration for Abram that she considered him to be her lord and was in absolute subjection to him. She didn't need the ornaments and decorations that were being offered, even by a pharaoh, for she was a beautiful person inside, having a meek and quiet spirit, which even God considered to be valuable and of great price. She was a rare woman, fearing her husband and not wanting to cause him offence, trusting in God, so that they were both pulling the same plough in the same direction, in complete harmony and unity. And in 1 Peter, Chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. This is what Peter says about Sarai. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they yet behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection to their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. God had to put them both through these tests because his promise to them was going to be an everlasting covenant and he needed to make sure they were the right people to entrust this to. Make no mistake, you cannot just walk into the plan of God without the necessary training. God is too just for that. It takes years for God to make the man. Many are called but few are chosen. And I'm sure this is because many are given the opportunity, but only a very few will actually go the whole hog where personal sacrifice is concerned and pay the high price God asks in payment for his promises. Yes, everything has a price and God is no exception. If you can't pay the price, then he will move on to the next person who possibly can because his plan will be fulfilled. So then, because both Abram and Sarah showed God that they didn't want to serve mammon, they wanted to see his plan come to pass in their lives. God delivered them from the most powerful man on the face of the earth and they were rewarded handsomely. Genesis 12, verses 17. The Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why said you she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now behold your wife, take her and go your way. Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away, and his wife, and all that he had. And Abram went up out of Egypt with his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him to the south. It seems to me that God is always trying to pick a fight with Egypt. Poor Pharaoh. On this occasion, he was actually the innocent party, but became the subject of terrible plagues from the Lord. He gave Sarai back to her husband, and Abram, who, after spurning Pharaoh's brotherly ties, was blessed for both financially and materially, as he was forced from Egypt. He was indeed an extremely wealthy man. This is not the only time that God plagued Egypt, for in the days of Moses, when God was determined to show his might and strength, he performed many miraculous signs, wonders, and sent terrible plagues upon this powerful nation to free the Israelites from the bondage of Egyptian slavery. The wonders he performed were so terrifying that the Egyptians couldn't get rid of the Israelites quickly enough and gave them gold, silver, exotic and expensive materials as gifts to hopefully buy their way back into Israelite favour and make sure they left with kind thoughts towards them. One thing was for sure. They did not want them to remain amongst them for their presence in Egypt spelt nothing but trouble. 
God had proven himself to be so powerful and had delivered Israel with such a mighty hand that Israel were greatly revered and Moses considered to be a very great man. If Lot was going to continue with Abram as part of his family, who were to inherit such unbelievable promises, then he also needed to be tested. Abram was the man with the call of God on his life. Lot had just jumped on his bandwagon because he had been inspired. But what had inspired him? What had made him leave Ur in the first place? We must remember that Lot was not a child, he was a grown man who had inherited his father's property, for he had his own herds and herdsmen. Genesis 13, 7 says this, And there was a strife between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. One thing Abram didn't want was trouble in the family. But even he could see that a problem had arisen which needed a drastic solution to enable each party to live together in peace and harmony. Being such a godly man, he humbled himself to his nephew and gave him the option of choosing where he preferred to live with the people in his employ. Genesis 13 verse 8 says this, And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and your herdmen, for we're brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself, I pray thee, from me. If you will take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or, if you depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord in the land of Egypt as you come into Saul. Then Lot chose all the plain of Jordan and journeyed east, and they separated themselves one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. It didn't matter to Lot that God had promised this land to Abram. Lot was looking out for number one, himself. That was the very reason why he'd come on this journey in the first place. He was a businessman, looking for material gain and benefit. It would be to his advantage to be able to trade with the five cities of the plain and he could live a more comfortable lifestyle. He jumped at the offer Abram made and chose the most desirable part of the land, the place which was described as being like the Garden of Eden, and pitched his tent towards the city, perhaps not realising that the men of that particular city were extremely wicked. Instead of honouring his uncle, who was heading up the whole expedition, he showed his greed and ambition, and Abram stood back and let him have what he wanted. How many men in his position would be able to do a thing like that? If God had promised that the land they were living in was Abram's inheritance, then it didn't matter who lived where. It was all his anyway, and no person or circumstance could alter that fact. Already, Abram had come too far and seen too much to think otherwise. I actually believe that God set Lot up for this separation because it wasn't Lot who had a problem with Abram. It was Abram's herdsman who had the problem with Lot's herdsman. So far, Abram had produced no children, and Lot was the closest kinsman he had. Lot would automatically consider himself to be the one to inherit in the event of Abram's death, because Abram wasn't interested in any woman other than his barren wife. God could see the future and would not allow him to have part in the inheritance. Lot was a problem to God's plan and therefore needed to go. Only a man of faith could have done what Abram did that day. One more of Abram's family members had to be removed from the scene as God was working towards the special, close relationship he was after, God and man. And just that. God doesn't call families. God calls a man. And God will do the same with each and every one of us. For with God, just as with those who are truly in love, to his company, Three or more 
is a crowd. Separation from our nearest and dearest can be one of the most painful experiences we have to face in our relationship with God. And God never apologizes for putting us through this, for it seems to be what affects us all the most. The Bible warns us often enough about God's character, but for some reason we never seem to hear about it from the pulpits of our churches before we make our commitment to serve him. He is portrayed as a benign God who solves all our problems without asking for anything in return. Yet in Exodus 34 verse 14 it says, You shall worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Deuteronomy 4 verse 24, The Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. Joshua 24 verse 19, Joshua said unto all the people, You cannot serve the Lord. For he's a holy God. He's a jealous God. Matthew 10, verse 34 to 38. Jesus said, Think not that I'm come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that doesn't take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. I don't think for one minute that God was seeking an opportunity to get rid of Sarai from Abram's life. Her tests were merely to sift and refine her. She was not seen as a near kinsman in God's eyes. She was Abram. She was his wife, and God had joined them together with a love that was real. Matthew 19, verse 5 to 6 says this, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. There can be no more perfect union on this earth than that of a husband and wife who have been joined together by God. And for this very reason, Abram was an exceptionally blessed man. For not only was she beautiful to look at, she was one with him in spirit. He didn't need anybody else if his wife was with him. He wasn't alone in his walk of faith. Because his heart was so set on believing what God had already said, God spoke again after the separation of Lot, for a sifting had taken place. Genesis 13, verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now your eyes, and look from the place where you are northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, to you will I give it and to your seed forever. And I will make your seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land, in the length of it, and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto you.